We have breaking news tonight. This just in. The Justice Department has officially asked an appeals court to stay or to block part of Trump appointed Judge Eileen Cannon's ruling granting Trump's request for a special master to review the seized government records from Trump's club. Tonight, in their motion, the Justice Department is specifically asking the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals to halt the special master from reviewing the 100 classified documents that's that small subset of the roughly 11,000 government records because they are going to conduct they are conducting an ongoing criminal investigation and intelligence assessment that is how the DOJ's stay request begins quote the district court has entered an unprecedented order in joining the executive branch's use of its own highly classified records in a, in a criminal investigation with direct implications for national security. The government continues, quote, Trump has identified no cognizable harm from merely allowing criminal investigators to continue to review and use the same subset of the seized records. The Justice Department does not hold back in this filing. Quote, Trump's only possible injury is the government's investigation, but that injury is not legally cognizable. Trump's only possible injury, injury in quotes there, is the government's investigation. Mic drop. We had been expecting the Justice Department to go to the appeals court after Judge Cannon denied its request to carve out an exception to her ruling. That would be, again, to exempt the roughly 100 classified documents seized from Mar-a-Lago last month from the special master's review. So this does not exactly come as a surprise, and it should be an easy case for the DOJ. The law on who owns presidential records and executive privilege is on the DOJ side. Nonetheless, the DOJ has an uphill battle here. There are 11 active judges on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Trump appointed six of those judges. But at this point, who knows? Anything could happen. For more on this breaking news, I want to bring in by phone Neil Katyal, former U.S. Acting Solicitor General during the Obama administration. In that role, Neil approved and took charge of all of the government's appeals. Um, Neil, thank you for joining on such short notice. Your reaction to this filing by the DOJ, it's not the full appeal, it's a request for a stay. What's the meaningful difference there? Is there one? And where in the game are we? So thank you, Alex. So some appeals kind of write themselves. And this one does because Judge Cannon's decision yesterday, I think, is probably the worst, the single most atrocious trial court decision I've ever read. And that's saying a lot. And so the department, I think, had a choice of how much do they want to appeal and how much do they want to go up on what's called an emergency stay, which is a temporary pause on her ruling. And what they did is they said the most important part they're going to go and seek emergency relief from the Court of Appeals. That's the hundred or so very sensitive national security documents. The department's pretty clear. The whole entire order by Judge Cannon is, to use the legal term, nutso. But they're not appealing the whole legal order right now. They're just appealing the really bad part of these documents. And what they say is that the criminal investigation will be hampered, that the, this judge is literally saying you can't use these documents in the criminal prosecution. They're saying the national security review is going to be hampered because you need criminal investigators to do that. Uh, you can't, the CIA doesn't operate, for example, on United States soil. So you need FBI agents and the like with their full suite of powers. And most importantly, and this is what you were saying a moment ago, for these kinds of highly national, highly sensitive national security documents, there's no claim whatsoever that Donald Trump owns these documents. Zero. Every day of the week. Yeah, that we repeated it twice because it's very strong language in this. Trump's only possible injury is the government's investigation, but that injury is not legally cognizable. That doesn't seem up for much dispute. Do you, I mean, what's your expectation here in terms of the 11th Circuit agreeing with the Department of Justice on this? I can't imagine that the 11th Circuit will disagree, uh, and I think the department is on incredibly strong footing. I mean, some, I, I, I don't think people can even really disagree much about the whole special master ruling by her. I mean, remember, it was Bill Barr, you know, Trump's attorney general, who said that this special master request is a crock of S-word. And frankly, I think that's unfair to crocs. But her decision <laughs> last night was like a crock of a crock of something. And I think it'll be quickly decided, Alex. So I suspect the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals will ask Trump's lawyers to respond by Monday uh, or possibly Tuesday and have a quick ruling 
thereafter. I mean, this should not take much time. I mean, the other Donald Trump could hire, resurrect Daniel Webster, the greatest you know Supreme Court advocate uh, in the United States history, and it wouldn't matter. He's got no argument, zero argument with these hundred documents. He has barely an argument on the whole special master thing as a whole. And I do expect the Eleventh Circuit to do the right thing here. I mean, after all, you know what Judge Cannon said yesterday, Alex, in justifying her order was Donald Trump is different. He's special because he's a former president. He gets privileges that literally no one else gets. And there has not been another case in the history of this country in which someone has gotten the kind of privileges that Judge Cannon gave to him and gave to him because he was a former president. And, you know, in America, we don't have two systems of justice, one for the president and one for everyone else. So, you know, the 11th Circuit, the case law is very good. The Justice Department goes out of its way to cite an opinion from the former chief judge of the 11th Circuit, which says, you know, federal stopping in trying to prevent documents from being used in criminal investigations. Neil Katyal, former U.S. Acting Solicitor General, thank you so much for your expertise joining us at this last minute, late night, late night breaking news. Much appreciated, Neil. Joining us now is Susan Church. She is an immigration attorney in Massachusetts who has spent the day today with some of the Venezuelan migrants who have been victims of Governor DeSantis's plan. Mrs. Church, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. So can you tell us what the current status of these migrants is, where they are, what resources are being allocated to them, and generally what their state of mind is? So they have been moved from Martha's Vineyard um, to the Otis Air Force Base uh, voluntarily. They were uh, a little scared to get on the bus today after what had already happened to them with Governor DeSantis. But with the help of some immigration lawyers who are on the team, they were convinced to go there, there voluntarily. Um, they're really confused and don't know why this has happened to them. I, I, I read reports and have talked to many of these individuals. and. They're just wondering why the world is doing this to them, really why the governor of Florida is doing to them this to them. Um, they're hoping that they can get their status straightened out. They're hoping that they can get their um, lives straightened out. They are all fleeing terror in their home countries. And now they're facing the same sort of uh, terror here, and, and they're hoping it ends soon. What of their immigration status? I think a lot, if not almost all of these folks were in the pro were, they're in the process of having scheduled hearings. Those hearings, I am assuming, are nowhere near Boston. What is their how is this affecting their immigration status and their court proceedings? So everyone here is uh, someone who's been everyone that I've seen so far was paroled in, which is a lawful status, which allows you to then seek uh, asylum or other forms of relief in immigration court. Uh, the courts are scattered everywhere. There are people with courts in Utah, Texas, California. I've seen them everywhere. People were lied to, by the way, about where they were going, and many people had asked for different locations and thought that they were going there. So it's very confusing to their immigration status because it really takes a lawyer to move a case from Utah to Boston, which is now where their case has to be heard. Um, there's another problem with um, trying to check in with ICE. They all had scheduled ICE check-ins with different locations. It, we're trying to relocate those and get those set up so that they're all located in Massachusetts. And it's really not something that you can handle without the help of an attorney. So it's, uh, it's good many people have volunteered to do so. Could they be considered victims of a crime perpetrated by Governor DeSantis here? I know that there are a number of different statutes that might apply. Could this be kidnapping? It doesn't sound like it's human trafficking, but the, the misleading nature of all of this, does, could that in turn actually favorably affect their immigration application? I'm very happy you asked that, because I do think a crime has been committed here. Let's start with the—I mean, I won't go through all of them, but kidnapping. Kidnapping is not a, uh, an allegation of force. It can be done with an allegation of fraud. So clearly, they were fraudulently put onto the plane, confined, dropped off in Martha's Vineyard. I think kidnapping has some strong investigatory uh, aspects that need to be taken on that. RICO, so the uh, Racketeering and Influence Corruption Act, that requires two predicate acts involving um, certain crimes. 
this is, sounds like we've got some large-scale cooperation between uh, DeSantis and Governor Abbott. Uh, whoever bought the planes is involved. There's a RICO charge. And Massachusetts has its own civil rights statute that um, also has significant ramifications for a case like this. So there's a lot to be looked at and a lot to be investigated here. And if they are victims of a crime, they could be eligible for something called a U visa. Is that right? That is correct. And even better than that. So a U visa is a uh, document that a local law enforcement agency, any of our local Massachusetts law enforcement agencies can investigate a crime and then they uh, sign a certification and then that's filed with immigration. And uh, it takes a long time to get a U visa. But most of these individuals, from what I'm seeing, would be prima facie eligible for a U visa as long as we got the certification. But even better than that, in Massachusetts, we are one of the very limited jurisdictions where a pending U visa is essentially uh, uh, issued by the First Circuit a decision saying you cannot deport somebody while they have a U visa pending. So even though U visa may take seven years, they cannot be removed from the country, whereas other people in similar jurisdictions would be removed while awaiting their U visa to be processed. So they've removed the individuals to one of the very few jurisdictions in the country where they will be protected by their criminal acts of DeSantis and uh, Governor Abbott. Amazing. The the thoughtlessness, it, the, the it thoughtlessness, is. the cruelty is backfiring in spectacular fashion. Susan Church, immigration attorney in Massachusetts, thank yes. you so much for your time and for everything that you are doing. Thank you. Joining us now is David Rode, executive editor of TheNewYorker.com. David, thanks for being here. I, I want to follow on what uh, Neil Katyal was saying, that Judge Cannon's ruling last night was the single most atrocious trial decision I've ever read. And the hope, of course, is that the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals agrees with that. But the reality is that we are in a moment in American politics where we have to look at who appointed judges as an yes. indicator of what they might do. And there are six Trump-appointed judges sitting on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. I find it distressing that the appointment, the presidential appointment, matters so very much. But Cannon has showed us a new side of the judiciary that should be distressing to anybody, and you've written about this. How are you looking at this moment? It is unprecedented, and it's a deeply disappointing ruling, you know, that, that she came out with yesterday. I, I want to point out the positive part here. Please. Which is that, you know, the judiciary was actually the branch of government that fought Trump the most in 2020. More than 80 judges, 80 state and federal judges, flat out rejected his claims of election fraud. This was this key period in November and December. Nearly half of them were Republican-appointed judges, and some of them were Trump-appointed judges. So it was vital. It was a great moment for democracy. Uh, you know, one branch, the judiciary branch, holding back an out-of-control president. What's happened, you know, with Judge Cannon has sort of turned all that on its head. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that these judges at the appellate court, these Trump appointees, will do the right thing, as other uh, Trump appointees did as well. And again, the special... Master, Judge Deary, he was appointed by Ronald Reagan. Yes. So it's possible, but this shows the kind of slow, corrosive effect of Trump just pressuring judges, wanting everyone to be political and everyone to be loyal to him. Well, yes. And one one would hope that the humiliation of, of you know, acting solicitor generals, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, other judges elsewhere in the country would have a cooling effect on judges who would model themselves in Judge Cannon's image. But you have to wonder whether it will. I mean, there are other young judges that Trump has appointed who have made other rulings that have been similarly beneficial for the Trump administration, whether it's mass mandates mass mandate, yeah. and, and the like. And I, I sort of wonder if there's an analog to what's happened in the legislature, in the legislative branch, right? You know, you had these single outliers, people who seemed like fringe candidates. And what we have seen, and we see it right now heading into November, is that it is a virus and it affects and infects a much larger swath of the conservative movement than I think any of us dared to think possible. Yeah, it's it's sort of this alternate reality thing, this whole different world. And what was so disturbing about Judge Cannon's uh, ruling yesterday was that she was almost echoing Trump's sort of worldview. She said, you can't trust the DOJ. Yes. She said, there's been these media leaks. I don't, I don't know exactly what she's referring to. And she said, as Neil talked about, that a former president deserves these special considerations under the law which is 
just un-American, fundamentally un-American. I mean, throughout this appeal, they cite United States versus Richard Nixon. Yes. And that was that, you know, no one is above the law in this country, the Presidential Records Act, which is that government documents belong to the people. And this very narrow appeal is for, you know, documents that are marked classified belong to the government. They don't belong to Donald Trump. Well, and the idea that she casts doubt on the, the government's assertion that these are classified documents after a season in which Trump and his lawyers have lied, obfuscated, misinformed on like every count imaginable for a year. Yeah. The, the suggestion is it's the Department of Justice that we might not trust. Quote, even-handed procedure does not demand unquestioning trust in the determinations of the Department of Justice. But we have photographs of these folders that have the words top secret and classified on them. But I agree with you. And what's, I guess, so disturbing, it's very disturbing now that it's a federal judge. But this is, again, how divided we are. And my worry is that he saw that your judicial branch stood up to him. Yes. He complained throughout his presidency when there would be these judges that would rule against him on immigration, on anything he wanted, and he dismissed them as sort of Obama judges. So he wants the public to think these aren't neutral arbiters. They're just, you know, loyal to whatever president puts them together. And my fear, I do think he'll run in 2024, and I think he's sort of, it's a Viktor Orban, the leader, the authoritarian leader of Hungary, his playbook. You kind of discredit the judiciary. Yes. You discredit a rival source of power over time. And, you know, if, let's say, 2024 disputed election and judges do the right thing and they rule against Trump, he will have discredited them in the eyes of the country. And by the way, it works both ways. A lot of people look at what Judge Cannon did and say, can we really trust the courts anymore? The institutional atrophy is uniform across partisan lines. David Rode, executive editor of The New Yorker.com. Thanks for being here tonight, David. Thank you. The autocrat's playbook is this. Human beings, especially black and brown human beings, can be very effectively and explicitly used as pawns to make a political point, to own the elites, to own the globalists. Does that remind you of anything else? Maybe something we're seeing here on the state level in the United States? On Wednesday, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis became the third governor to use taxpayer dollars to transport migrants and asylum seekers from Republican states to liberal cities like New York and D.C. and Chicago, to really stick it to Biden and the liberal elites and their cities that already enjoy large, diverse immigrant populations. To make some kind of point, DeSantis sent nearly 50 migrants on planes to Martha's Vineyard without informing any local authorities that plane loads of people who would need housing and food and care were on their way. He did alert Fox News, though, and he hired a videographer. And by the way, these migrants were lured there from San Antonio, Texas, not Florida. The plane made a pit stop in Florida, though, on the way to Martha's Vineyard. The migrants were misled with false promises of expedited work and jobs and housing and other services. Some were reportedly offered $50 gift cards. Some were lied to about where exactly they were even going and what to expect when they actually arrived. One migrant said a woman named Perla even paid him to help fill the flight to Martha's Vineyard. At least one migrant told NBC she thought she was being flown to Boston. As of today, migrants who wanted to go to the mainland for housing, which Martha's Vineyard does not have much of, they have arrived at a military base on Cape Cod, thanks to the governor of Massachusetts. But here is what Governor DeSantis said privately last week to a room full of top Republican donors. The Washington Post reports that in a 51 minute speech, he told hundreds of donors, quote, I do have this money. I want to be helpful. Maybe we'll go to Texas and help. Maybe we'll send to Chicago, Hollywood, Martha's Vineyard. Who knows? The remarks were full of grievance and harping on culture wars and claims that the libs have been, quote, winning this fight, making Republicans and people like DeSantis look like second class citizens. He went on to say, quote, we're not just arguing about tax rates. We're not just arguing about normal policies. You know, we're arguing about whether people that dissent from leftist ideology should have any voice in our government in society at all. Of liberals, DeSantis said, and they've been winning this fight for, I would say, the last five or 10 years. All the grievance, all the vengeance. It sure sounds a lot like Lukashenko. Oh, and by the way, this plan, at least here in the U.S., was first dreamed up back in 2019 by the most grievance-filled anti-immigrant politicians of them all, former White House immigration advisor Stephen Miller and his patron, President Donald Trump. Quote, the Trump administration, led by immigration advisor Stephen Miller, 
originally floated such a plan, but concerns within Immigrations and Customs Enforcement led them to scuttle the idea, which drew considerable backlash at the time. So to be clear, even the Trump administration did not implement this cruel and unusual plan, not for moral reasons per se, but because it was risky. Still, the administration that brought you family separation at the border predicted this plan would be riddled with problems. But somehow, some way, Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida did not. 